Data and how to collect data and technology is one crucial question that planners are facing. Another, and perhaps the biggest, is how to reckon with a changing climate. Many cities that are most at risk for climate change are also some of the world's largest and fastest growing. And this means that the future city must solve these problems, and soon. Sea level rise is one climate change related risk, and this will affect some parts of the world more than others. Places like Bangladesh are especially at risk for sea level rise, and that has to do with the geography and topography of the Bay of Bengal. But also, Dhaka, Bangladesh is one of the world's largest cities, and you can see that it is located right in an area that may be inundated in the next hundred years. Even the San Francisco Bay Area, with all of its hills and mountains, has some risks from sea level rise. You can see that parts of the bayfront, places like East Palo Alto, are at risk for flooding. Larger questions emerge here. In a place like Bangladesh, what are the solutions? There might be very expensive solutions, like trying to physically alter the seafront, building things like walls to hold back the water. But the question is, how sustainable are those solutions and, and can those really last? So are we talking about the movement of millions or even tens of millions of people? And where will those people go? And these are the types of questions that planners have to grapple with. Reports like the left are really sobering. The fact that by 2050, 150 million people around the world could be displaced by desertification, water scarcity, floods, storms, and other directly climate change related disasters. That's a report from the Brookings Institution in 2014. And again shown here is Bangladesh and the delta where the city of Dhaka is located. Dhaka is a mega city that is very much at risk for the impacts of sea level rise. Another huge threat though are things like automation. And this is a report from Goldman Sachs in 2017. The possibility of the loss of 300,000 driving based jobs in the United States per year going forward because of driverless technology. That is one possible outcome. This map shows global cities most at risk from sea level rise and storm surge. So there are two important points here. One is that many of the world's largest cities are also some of the most vulnerable, including Los Angeles, New York, London, and Tokyo. Also, many of the cities most at risk are located in Asia, South America, and other parts of the global south. And this means that the people that are most at risk may be marginalized and therefore most difficult to reach. We talk about the Anthropocene, the idea that human beings and the built environment are influencing the global climate. And this can really be seen looking at a city like Boston. This is an urban heat island. So the red colors on this map show warmer temperatures the greens and blues on this map show cooler temperatures. Those tend to be forested areas, rural areas away from the city. The city of Boston, you can see, is much hotter than its surrounding area. This is what's called an urban heat island. So cities are not only contributing to global climate change, cities are also influencing their own local environments. And some cities can be as much as 10 to even 20 degrees warmer than their surrounding areas. And that's really going to matter in a changing climate because in a time when some cities may become too hot for public health, the fact that there's urban heat islands can make those effects even more severe. What is sustainable development? Sustainability is one of those words that's thrown around. Is it always understood? And what is sustainable development? How can urban development be sustainable? And there's a couple different definitions that I might introduce to you. One of them is from the United Nations Environmental Program in 1991. And it's fairly simple. It's that sustainable development means improving the quality of life while living within the carrying capacity of supporting ecosystems. That may seem pretty straightforward. The idea that cities can grow, cities can improve themselves, but only if that is within the carrying capacity of supporting ecosystems. What is a sustainable city then, specifically? Houghton and Hunter in 1994 define that as a city in which its people, 
and businesses continuously endeavor to improve the natural, built, and cultural environments at both neighborhood and regional levels, while working in ways which always support the goal of global sustainable development. So think about whether that's the case in the city in which you live. Another definition for sustainable city, this is from Herbert and Giraudet from 1999. A sustainable city is organized so as to enable all of its citizens to meet their own needs and to enhance their well-being without damaging the natural world or endangering the living conditions of other people, either now or in the future. So not just improving the sustainability now, but thinking about future generations. And that's something that unfortunately planners haven't been that good at doing. It's a pretty short-termist profession and practice. Plans often have to be delivered in a certain time period. They have set end goals. Plans might be five-year plans or 10-year plans or even 30-year visions, but rarely do planners consider multiple generations in the future, and that has to change. Researchers know characteristics of sustainable cities, and I know to many practitioners this will not be new. We know, looking back at the mistakes of the past, that it's less sustainable to have low density, spread out residential development or sprawl. A segregation of land uses, in other words, homes far away or inaccessible from jobs or shopping, that requires more car trips, that requires higher mobility. So think about the way that suburbia developed where there were strict separations and segregations between land uses. That's not that sustainable. Employment that is based on polluting industries, heavy dependence on private cars, the use of non-renewable energy sources, fossil fuels, thermals, nuclear, these are less sustainable. More sustainable, compact residential forms. Again, that is pretty uh, obvious, but that requires less carbon emissions. It's also healthier. It might encourage walking. That will then save money on public health. It can also improve happiness. There's lots of other indicators. A mix of land use, homes, jobs, and shopping integrated together. Employment primarily based on education and skills. So that's economic sustainability, thinking about how to make a city or a region economically sustainable in the future. You can't rely on industries that may become defunct. And a lot of cities have had to learn that lesson the hard way. Cities that were based around one industry, whether that's cars or textiles or coal or steel, those were not future thinking cities. So cities that are flexible and future thinking in their economies are more sustainable. Cities that encourage movement on foot, by bicycle, or public transit, and that use renewable energy, wind, solar, hydro, and other sources. It is more sustainable for tertiary use of sewage. So rather than spending huge amounts of energy in expensive and inefficient sewage plants, uh, find ways to use gray water to separate the worst sewage and reuse what's possible, to use it for fertilizing, to use it to replenish uh, ecosystems and estuaries. Natural open space versus planned open space. So what does that mean? That means perhaps allowing rivers to have their natural floodplains. That's both an effective flood management tool. It's also a public space in a public park. It's also more sustainable than trying to build a park in a way that changes the environment. Less sustainable approaches. How do we deal with waste, landfills, incinerators? Those aren't good. The destruction of the natural landscape and the construction of manicured parkland. And that might look really beautiful, but the sad truth is a lot of parks import uh, species that may not be native. They rely on uh, fertilizers or pesticides. Hard surfaces concrete, asphalt, these cause runoff. These also uh, change the way that light and heat are reflected and can add to urban heat islands. And there are materials now that are porous. There are types of uh, sidewalks and streets that allow water to permeate. And finally, discharging sewage into water bodies rather than 
treating it or finding other ways to reuse it. So those are all characteristics of more sustainable or less sustainable cities. And we know this, and this is what's exciting, is that we have figured out what is sustainability and there's lots of technologies that are already invented that we can use. And so that is kind of exciting to watch the way that these green technologies are implemented. The idea of the zero carbon city is gaining traction. And this is Mazdar, which was the envisioned zero carbon city in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And I'm quoting now. In 2008, Mazdar city broke ground and embarked on a daring journey to develop the world's most sustainable eco city. Through smart investments, Mazdar city is successfully pioneering a green print for how cities can accommodate rapid urbanization and dramatically reduce energy, water, and waste. The city, which combines ancient Arabic architectural techniques with modern technology and captures prevailing winds, is naturally cooler and more comfortable during high summer temperatures. Those temperatures, by the way, can be higher than 50 degrees Celsius or 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now I'm quoting again. With a few thousand people living and working in Mazdar City, it is on its way to realizing its vision. But this is only the beginning. Mazdar City continues to add new businesses, schools, restaurants, apartments, and much more, creating the diversity of any major modern city. When complete, 40,000 people will live in Mazdar City, with an additional 50,000 commuting every day to work and study. And this is from Mazdar.ae, which is the official website of the development. Does anyone have questions? I do. How is this going to be built? Using what money? Is it sustainable to have 50,000 people commuting here every day? Does it make sense to build this at all in the middle of a desert that can be 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit? These are some critical questions that I have about Mazdar. Indeed, the fate of Mazdar is too often the fate of these grand eco-city ideas. And now I'm quoting from The Guardian in 2016. As of this year, when Mazdar was originally scheduled for completion, managers have given up on the original goal of building the world's first zero carbon city. Mazdar City is nowhere close to zeroing out its greenhouse gas emissions now, even at a fraction of its planned footprint. And it will not reach that goal even if the development ever gets fully built, the authorities admitted. And this photo shows a kind of sad looking Mazdar in reality. Santa Monica, California voted on the world's first zero net energy building requirement and implementation began in 2017. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and whether Santa Monica will be able to achieve its goals or whether it will, like Mazdar, fall short. So on one hand, it's good that cities are embracing these ideas and that they are being experimented with. But on the other hand, achievability is really important. And that's a theme that runs throughout all these eras of planning. Plants need to have a roadmap for achievability, otherwise they're just rhetorical exercises. Some cities have higher carbon emissions than others, and so some cities and metros have a longer way to go to reduce carbon emissions. And so in this sense, California and the West Coast has a head start, and so we should be proud of ourselves out here in California. Part of that has to do with climate. California's Mediterranean climate means that Residents in places like LA, San Diego, or the Bay Area don't need heat or air conditioning as much. And that's a large part. Um, you look at a place like Florida, and unfortunately a lot of the carbon emissions have to do with air conditioning there. Heavy industry is to blame in places like the Ohio Valley and upper Midwest. 